Greetings, everyone. Welcome to week five, lesson one. There's only one Do You Know lecture this week. This week, we will review physical resilience, health maintenance, we'll be developing a realistic health plan, and identifying wellness activities. What is health? I asked students at the College of St. Scholastica for various definitions of health, fitness, and well-being. And the following slides are what they came up with. So what is health? What activities, actions, and thoughts define health? So one statement that a student came up with was health is a state of complete mental, physical, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. It also encompasses an individual's ability to handle mental, physical, and social challenges. Now this student looked at the World Health Organization definition of health. Another student said that the status that embodies a person as a physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual being. This status is multidimensional and is dependent upon what a person experiences from day to day. Another student stated a measure of a person's deviation from accepted emotional, physical, or physiological norms pertaining to that person's overall well-being, including emotion, emotional, physical, social, and mental factors. So you can see, just interviewing three different people, I got three different responses. Everyone thinks of health in a different way and manner. It's the same thing with fitness. Fitness is multidimensional. Again, interviewing a few different students that came up with a few different perceptions of what fitness is. They said one student, for instance, thought that it was the improvement upon various physiological factors using a variety of training types. Another student thought that it's a person's ability to accommodate novel or increased amounts of stressors. And thirdly, a person thought that it is a person's capacity to withstand life stressors. Now on to another multidimensional topic, well-being. For some of us, we consider well-being to come from four sources. So recognizing, resourcing, regulating, and relating. And those four sources of well-being all connect to our three fundamental needs, safety, satisfaction, and connection. So this idea is from Dr. Rick Hansen and his foundations program. So as you may remember from the first lecture, I used a wellness wheel to describe the multiple dimensions of wellness, such as physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, intellectual, social, and environmental. On the screen, you'll see another way to describe well-being that may resonate with you. And as I mentioned, it's from Dr. Rick Hansen's description, and they are the four sources of well-being compared to the three fundamental needs. So it creates a 12 pillar system of well-being. With each pillar are certain attributes. And these attributes support your well-being and level of resilience. So you'll see self-caring, mindfulness, learning, vitality, gratitude, confidence, calm, motivation, intimacy, courage, aspiration, and service. Do you notice any of the pillars that are really strong for you? Or do you notice any pillars that might need to be strengthened? During the rest of this lecture, we'll discuss habits in our life that we can do to support our well-being, such as getting enough sleep and physical activity. Even, these, even though these are not specifically listed under the pillars, they are a very important aspect of well-being. And I would say they are the groundwork underneath the pillars. So let's discuss why these habits are important. So let's face it, sleep is just as important as eating and drinking water. Despite this, lots of us do not get enough sleep and experience a lot of problems as a result. 
the National Sleep Foundation conducted surveys revealing that a lot of Americans suffer from over 70 different sleep disorders. Not only that, but 60% of adults and 69% of children experience one or more sleep problems a few nights or more a week. In addition, more than 40% of adults experience daytime sleepingness severe enough to interfere with their daily activities at least a few days each month, with 20% reporting a problem with sleepiness a few days a week or more. On the flip side, getting a healthy amount of sleep is linked to increased memory, longer life, decreased inflammation, increased creativity, decreased fat and increased muscle mass, also lower stress, decreased risk of depression, decreased risk of getting into accidents, and decreased dependence on stimulants, stimulants like caffeine. There's also many, many more. An increased sense of well-being begins with a good night's sleep, according to the Mayo Clinic. Regular phys physical activity can help you fall asleep faster and deepen your sleep as long as you don't do exercise too close to your bedtime, or you may be too energized to fall asleep. Do you recall your SMART goals? How can you incorporate these definitions into your SMART goals? To begin, do you know what your current state of health is? So let's revisit the concept of SMART goals. This concept will help you to create a health plan. SMART goals are systematic, they're measurable, achievable, reasonable and realistic, and timely. What SMART goal could you make to integrate physical activity in your life and to incorporate, if needed, more sleep in your life. When creating your SMART goal, you'll want to think about the following questions. What is your fitness level according to your definition of fitness? Remember to take into account your body type and your self-image. Also think about what is your goal? Is it achievable? Is it reasonable? Why are you doing it? And is it timely? Also think about what type of training do you want or need to help you reach this goal? Is it cardio-based training? Is it strength training? A little bit of both. Is it training related to a specific sport? Also think about what nutritional changes you can make in order to help you reach your goal. Also keep in mind that you may fall off the wagon a few times and think about planning ahead for vacations and holidays to keep yourself on track. You may want to think about if you're having a lot of stress in your life and if you're addressing or doing something about the stress. Stress can cause you to derail from your healthy habits. Remember the too good to be true concept. If it seems too good, then be skeptical of claims that trainers or nutritionists are making. Most changes come with time and a bit of effort. Besides setting a SMART goal, there's various tools you can use to keep on track with your goals. For instance, you can keep a journal. This will help you keep track of the physical activities and goals, and you'll see that you're making progress and improving. You can also find a workout buddy to go with you. This will help you add a little fun and motivation to your workouts. You can utilize your friends, let them know of the changes that you're making, and let them know a way that they can support you. Same with family. If you have family members that are also working on the same goals, you can work together to meet those goals. And you can also schedule a check-in. So make sure that you look at your journal, keep in touch with those workout buddies and friends and family, and check in on your progress. 
You may also want to consider the timeline for your changes and be patient with yourself. So for new activities, it doesn't take much time to start doing a new thing in your life, but keeping it constantly present in your life may be a little bit trickier. So just keep that in mind when you're planning time for these new events. Also remember that lifestyle and habits can take anywhere from two to eight months for that activity to become a routine and to fit naturally in your everyday life. So be patient with a new change. I would also like to discuss determining what wellness activity is right for you. Keep in mind that the right activity is the one that gets done. So some examples of different activities are casual walking or biking, also stretching, sitting, lightweight training. You could also consider dancing or playing catch. Some examples of some moderate activities include brisk walking, walking uphill, hiking, roller skating, or bicycling at a leisurely pace. If you're interested in low impact aerobic activities, consider water aerobics or yoga or gymnastics. You can also jump on a trampoline, participate in some weight training. If you're looking for a moderate activity, try dancing or punching a boxing bag. And most aerobic machines are also moderate activities if they're at a moderate pace. So like a stair climber, elliptical, or stationary bike at a moderate pace is a moderate activity. Also competitive tennis, volleyball, badminton, uh, swimming or canoeing, horseback riding, golf, as long as you carry the clubs, are also moderate activities. Uh, if you live in the Northland, like me, shoveling snow is also a moderate activity. Or if you're a parent and you're carrying a child around, that also is a moderate activity. If you're looking for a more intense activity, vigorous dancing or boxing, and an aerobic machine set at a vigorous pace is also considered a vigorous activity. Jumping ropes, jumping jacks, or circuit weight training and bicycling at more than 10 miles an hour is a vigorous activity. Also swimming or synchronized swimming is a vigorous activity if it's at a vigorous pace. Pushing a non-motorized lawnmower is also a vigorous activity or heavy weightlifting is a vigorous activity. If you're looking for more information about the activities that I just talked about, there are lots of resources online. Again, be wary if they're promising things that just seem too good to be true. The resources that I have listed on my slide are resources that I share with the students that I work with and when I'm teaching, and they're references that I go to for up-to-date health information. So keep these things in mind when you're Googling workout routines or fitness routines that you want to make sure that they're coming from a legitimate source. So check out the resources that I have online and it will help to start you off on the right track. So remember to be kind to yourself on this journey. Just like we have learned throughout this course, having a perceived sense of well-being and working on a specific health plan will help you manage your emotions, which in turn will increase your level of resilience. You may have to try many different activities before finding one that you like. In the next lesson, we'll discuss more specifics related to physical activity, nutrition, and building resilience. Thank you for joining me today, and please continue to work on the checklist for this week, and I'll see you next week.